to show that you completed the course. I think it's going to be a wonderful time. If you want to invite visitors to come with you, you're welcome to do it. Uh, you might get some folks to come to that that might not come in the church building. And if I've been told once, I've been told probably a hundred times, well, preacher, I'd come to church, but if I came, the roof would cave in. How many of you ever heard that? And I said, well, I doubt that'll happen. It's pretty sturdy, but uh, I don't want it to happen. So we're doing that. Then to move on to um, the Baptist bread um, devotionals. Been praying about that for some months. Uh, that's a mission from Brother Green, our missionary evangelist. And so um, I'll try and contact him this week, but it looks like for about 50 of those a, uh, all year long for a subscription of 50, it's going to be right around $400 a year uh, to get those, but they are completely our stripe. They are independent. They are fundamental Baptist devotionals, and they are very applicable. And so that's what they are. They are very, very applicable. How many of you have those or have read those or are getting those now? All right. Several of you are very familiar with them. And so if you're interested, you say, hey, pastor, I just want to pay the $400 a year and make it a gift to the church. Um, you let me know after the service and I won't have to print any cards. But if you uh, would say, hey, I'll give $10 a a month or two dollars a month. We used to give out newspapers. Any of you remember the newspapers? All right. They were rural route newspapers. They went all over the place and they went south and started using other translations and really gummed up the works. And so we stopped that. And most of those funds, I know I was giving as a teenager to the newspaper, and now that is still carried on. My gift to that now has gone into the recorded media, which also is our video um, recorded media also at this point. But now we have another opportunity. Uh, I'm thinking about buying 50 of those, which would be right at $400, and then um, 60 uh, would be a little bit more. But if you're interested in that, just let me know. And if you're interested, say, hey, $400, I'll do it. I'll take care of that this, for the entire year. You let me know, and then I will let, the, um, we'll let folks know, and you can just put it right in the offering plate. Well, that's all the big business for tonight. We are glad you're here. Anybody have a favorite hymn tonight? Right back there, Sister Pat. You know, and they too shall be one flesh. She raised her hand and he turned in the book without them talking. He knew what she was going to do. And uh, my wife usually does a little better job at that than I do, but Mike was on it. What number was it again, Brother Mike? Did you see how I did that? 245. The old account was settled. I'll let you sit for this The third verse is where the blood is. So on that one, we do verses one and three. <clears throat> Up there, you'll not forget it. 
Yes, settled it long ago, long ago. Twenty-seven, three hundred twenty-seven. Hymn number three twenty-seven. Higher ground, verses one and four of Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I gain. Plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven, stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. <coughs> then save land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. 356. If two of you had answered, I would have been in a lot of trouble. Hymn number 356. I must tell Jesus. Hymn number one and four. Praise the Lord. Hymn number one and four. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus on the fourth now. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me. Over the world, the victory to win. Sing it now. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Elijah. 86. Well, we've got a lot of hands tonight, so I'm going to try and get as many as I can. This is the favorite of where? Glenburn service. They love this song um, about Andy. Andy in the garden. Um, Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Okay. All right, here we go. 86 on one and three. You're getting a workout tonight. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses The Son of God discloses And He 
walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the boy we share as we tarry there none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is called. with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Yes, truly, that is Sister Pointer's love song. And he talks with me, and he walks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's, that's just sweet. That's sweet. You get back there, and she's just going to be big love eyes like cartoons. All right. Well, we're going to stop there for a minute, have a word of prayer, um, and then we'll do uh, some more favorites. I'm sorry, but you're stuck with me this evening uh, for everything. And so we'll, uh, we'll do our best to uh, keep things moving right along. Let's bow our heads together. And uh, Brother Armstrong, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. Uh, one announcement, important announcement, cleaning day is just around the corner. Uh, make sure if you can't make that day, ladies, uh, give uh, Mrs. Carmen Jr. Uh, if you'll check in with her and she will give you an assignment and you can let her know that, hey, this is done. You don't have to worry about it. We already have that taken care of. It takes a lot of hands to get everything accomplished. And uh, for everyone else, the cleaning day is August 13th, 8 a.m. till whenever it's done. They're going to have sloppy joes and hot dogs and goodies. If you're here and you're able um, if you, to do that, boy, it'd sure be a blessing to us. Uh, we are um, up in the school by uh, two more. And um, so uh, three new students this year and two more over the attendance of last year. And so the Lord's doing some great things at Calvary Christian School, and we're excited about the new year. Uh, but that also means we have the opportunity to uh, move in more desks, and uh, we have a lot of um, opportunities for next year because we'll have several uh, moving from room to room and we're going to have to praise the Lord build more offices and so if we know of anybody that's handy with woodworking and he walks with me and he talks with me Randy there we go 
Ran, ran, wait. Randy walks with me. There we go. Hey, it can work. So, Randy and Andy, how about them apples? No, truthfully, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just joking, fellas. Um, I know that's putting undue pressure on you. But anybody in the church that knows how to do some woodworking, I do believe Brother Duncan does have the, um, the dividers and all those things, all the measurements. Um, these new ones are going to be a little different. We'll have to start but it's not for this school year, but for next. So we have a year to get it finished, um, but these will probably have to be on casters and freestanding. And so, but that's exciting. Praise the Lord. It's work, but praise the Lord, it is exciting. And um, we're glad of that. Well, let's do one more. Why did you say that with a grin? 479. Boy, that's way back there. Yeah, I think you're pretty funny, don't you? Hallelujah. 103. I see how you are. One of the nice things about that, or the fun things, is if you ever try to sing that by yourself, all four parts, it's a kick. All right. We had a guy in college said, um, made us all practice to see if we could sing the hallelujah chorus all by ourselves. And it was a challenge. Under his wings. I'm not sure that I can lead this one, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> Stand with me if you would on that last verse, and children, you are dismissed. Hymn number 103 on the last. singing you may be seated all right try and put this little guy back in
And we are in lesson number 76, lesson number 76, uh, deception and heartache. Oh, well, would you looky there? <laughs> Happy birthday, Dad, Dr. Riker. How about them apples? Is today your birthday? His birthday gift's back there leaning on the wall. It's a walking stick and a monopod, and his best son gave that to him. You have a gift for Dr. Riker? Amen. Amen. Let's give him a good round of applause. And we sang to him Sunday morning. And uh, we, we had some food over at our house today. And I'm glad for him to be with us and have a happy, happy birthday. All right, let's move right along. Genesis chapter 27 and verse number 8. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Of course, this is Rebecca speaking. To that which I commanded thee, go now to the flock and fetch me from thence to ki good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said uh, to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. And my father peradventure will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Seem as a deceiver. I always, I always chuckle at that part. No, you are a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son, and only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her oldest son, which were with her in the house and put them upon Jacob her younger son and she put the skins of the kids upon, of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob and he came unto his father and said my father and he said here am I who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found so quickly my son? And he said, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Isn't it always interesting to find someone in sin who is trying to make their sin godly? Mm -hmm. Trying to rationalize sin by using the word of God. We see it in the life of Saul. We see it in so many lives. And we see it in lives today. And probably, uh, we don't want to be hypocritical because sometimes we've done it ourselves, I'm sure. Don't try to make God part of your sin. Don't try to make God part of your sin. Um, let's drop down 22. And Jacob went near unto him, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, and his brother Esau's hands, as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? Giving him another chance to do right. And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. And therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth 
and plenty of corn and wine. Let the people serve thee, and the nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over the, thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing, uh, end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. It is, sad, it is a sad thing to see that a, that a couple that was brought together in faith sought God together to give them children, now have a family that is building on deception and trickery. So we look at the life of Isaac and Rebekah, and it is so beautiful what God hath joined together. But now it has gone a, a long way from that to a building block or a foundation of Jacob's family, which he is going to build on deception and trickery. Uh, a side note, trickery and deception are a product of of a doubting soul. You might want to remember that trickery and de uh, deception are a product of a doubting soul. What am I saying there? They are not of faith. A person of faith does not need to rely on trickery and deception. Rebecca put her hand to what God had already established. God had made a plan. God had a plan. He had already told Rebekah what was going to happen. But as the men who grabbed for the um, Ark of the Covenant, as the wagon turned back and forth, they thought they'd help God out a little bit, and God struck them down. Well, we're going to see that there is a lot of pain and heartache through the deception that um, Rebekah orchestrated and Jacob followed through with. The girl who trusted God in her life and marriage is now doubting him with her son's life. And 25, 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the eldest shall serve the younger. Rebekah had questioned God about her son's while they were still in the womb. He gave her a definitive answer, and by faith she should have received it and watched God do his perfect work. I gave you the answer, Rebecca. I, I, I gave you Isaac. I gave you safety on your journey. I gave you sons like you asked. But now you're doubting what I'm doing. She was a woman of faith, and now has become a facilitator of deception. We're going to dig into that just a little bit on the next slide. I'm trying to go through these rapidly. Um, I tried to get 30 slides tonight, but I wasn't able to. Now I'm looking right at you. Because she said in, in our couples retreat, Mrs. Carmen Sr. said, I, we had a thing where you made memes. And I had a sad kitty cat face. And she said the meme for that is the look you get when your pastor says point one of 31 or point one of 30. So I thought tonight maybe I'd try to get 30 slides in, but we're only at 21 but, or 23. So, but we're going to try and stay with and get through this as quickly as possible. Here's our application of what we're learning with Rebecca. Well, how do we apply what's going on in Rebecca's life to how it affects our life. Um, every time I read the Word of God, and every time you read the Word of God, you ought to read it, visualize it, personalize it, apply it, and then memorize it. And so as I look at this, I can visualize this easily. I can, vis I can picture this. I picture Esau as being one of those guys that you pat him on the back and it feels like he has a wool sweater on under his t-shirt. 
That's what I, have you ever met somebody, I mean, you touch his back and it feels like he's got a wool sweatshirt on. I think that's what Esau was. And here he's a man's man. Everybody would have picked him. I would have picked him. Do you want the cooker, the tent stayer, or Esau, the hunter, the strong, the eater of venison? <laughs> you know, and we're so excited about Esau, and God said, no, I see his heart. His heart is worse than his outside. You can look at his outside all day long, but he doesn't um, care for the things of God like he cares um, for himself. So the application here is one may, uh, may begin to eavesdrop into matters because they are placing more faith in their ability to fix a situation than God's ability to control it. I'm guilty, totally guilty of this. I often think God needs my help. And I can't stand it when there's trouble or trials in front of me that I can't fix. And that un inability to fix something creates often a fixation of my mind on what I cannot fix fix with my hand and that fixation turns to worry and doubt what are both of those they are both enemies of faith they are both enemies of faith and with all they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house and not only idle but tattlers also in busybody, speaking things which they ought not. My daughter went off to college, and I asked her one day, she said, well, the, a lot of people are saying a lot of things about me, Dad, and da-da-da-da-da. I said, this is a college of busybodies who are idle. If you have time to talk about my faults, and my flaws, you really ought to get busy for God. How dare you stand around idle with your time that literally you have nothing more to talk about than John Riker and his flaws. Number one, it's so easy to see them. And number two, why is that the first thing on your mind to talk about the flaws of others? Why is it that you want to be a busybody getting into other people's business? It's ridiculous. So how do we stop it? Jacob could have stopped and said, Mom, this is between me, Esau, and Dad. He should have stepped up as a man. Jacob should have said, Mom, I appreciate you loving me so much. But I put this off long enough. I need to go talk to dad. I need to man up, mom. I need to prove my salt. Esau's going to be mad. He might want to kill me. But he sold it to me. And God knew it. And God will work it out. You know, sometimes you have to do that with busybodies. They call and have nothing more to talk about than Randy Sapp and Gene Riker and Anna um, Place and... Uh, Laura Pointer, you have nothing better to talk about than that? I'll say, hey, just stop and say, you know what? Let's take a minute and pray about, it, about this. You start. Wh 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 <laughs> Sounds like a dog getting ready to bark. <laughs> <laughs> I get tired of it, don't you? I don't need to know about people all over the country. Send your kids off to college and you start knowing, hearing stuff. Oh, well, this happened at Bourbon A and this happens at Dwight and this happens at, at um, Elgin and this happens at Timbuktu. And I'm like, I don't care what they do. That's between them and God. None of my business. I don't have time to think about that. Somebody says, well, Brother John, everybody in the church... Um, will judge me. I said, nobody's got time to judge you. How arrogant. 
to think that when you walk through the door, I have time to judge you. I have time to judge you. That's God's job. It would be arrogant of me, but right now it's arrogant of you. Oh, i got to preach on it. It just made me mad. Proverbs 23. Don't be a busybody. Don't be a tattler. Speak evil of no man. All biblical principles. And here Rebecca is in business that is not her business. It's her son. This is not her business. This is Jacob's business. But when he failed to do what he should have done, Rebecca stepped in. And she was listening when he wasn't. Um, it is an honor for a man to cease from sight from strife but every fool will be meddling when you meddle in other people's business what's the bible call you well right there but every what will be meddling a fool every fool's going to meddle and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Be busy about your own business. 2 Thessalonians 3.11 For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. All these things we should learn from and apply to our lives. A busy body lacks faith for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly working not at all but are busybodies well then we look at the next part of application faith is working and a busybody is idle these two cannot coexist a busybody who is full of faith it's impossible because scripture teaches that a busybody is lazy while um, faith is laboring. Jacob's excuses. I, I'm going to try and keep moving. Jacob's excuses. Number one, he wasn't being a busybody. He wasn't listening in to everything his dad was saying. So he was clean of that. Number two, he didn't produce the plan. He didn't make his own plan. This was Rebecca's plan. Number three, he obeyed his mom. So if he had any excuse, those would be my top three. There may be many reasons why one does what they do, but the devil made me do it does not change your accountability to sin. You're still accountable. The devil made me do it. Mom told me to do it. It doesn't count. You are accountable for your actions. Side note, and I like this because I think it's very fitting. I use it around the school. An excuse is just a lie dipped in chocolate because chocolate makes everything taste better. An excuse is just a lie dipped in chocolate. Some people believe contrarily that Rebecca in her scheme was acting in faith. Now there is a segment of people who believe Rebecca was working in faith that God wanted her to do this. Um, that as a good mother she listened in to be sure that God's plan would be fulfilled. The idea that she acted in sincerity and faith is contrary to what we learn in 2 Timothy 3.13. It says, but evil men and seducers, <laughs> evil men and seducers, I have no idea what word I was trying to say, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I had a friend, I love this verse because I always think of her, and she just uh, put out there the other day how she is an elementary teacher. She came to camp one day and her car was a fire engine red, little sporty looking car. A cute little car and I came up and I noticed she got a new paint job it had um, one of those paint jobs that kind of was a gradient I don't know what it what you would call it gradients what they call it in Photoshop where it kind of changes from one color to another and it was like a gray hue to a red and I said wow that's pretty neat and so I went down and I talked to her I said wow that's amazing 
Where, what did you do? Where did you get your paint job at? And she said, are you picking on me? I said, no. What do you mean? She said, I washed my car. I said, you washed your car? Yeah, my dad's really mad. She said, I started washing it and my pan bucket of water kept turning red. I said, kept turning red? Why? She said, you know those little metal things that you wash pans with? I went through a box of those washing my car. And I went, <laughs> she waxed worse and worse. And um, <laughs> oh, she's an elementary teacher now. Hopefully it's not in like youth mechanics or anything. Rebecca knew that judgment would come for their actions. And that, so we can say, oh, Rebecca worked by faith. But really, Jacob knew hey, this could go bad. Well, doing God's will doesn't go bad. It doesn't bring a curse. And Rebecca then says, um, in verse number 13, and his mother said unto him, upon me be thy curse, my son. So if a curse comes because of this, let it be on me. So she knew what she was doing could have repercussions and she had to know that it was wrong. It is interesting to note that Jacob was concerned about Isaac catching him but not about God catching him. Isn't that interesting? You notice he said, oh, dad might figure it out and he might put a curse on me. Jacob, God's watching you. This is the blessing of God that has been passed down from Abraham to Isaac to you. This isn't some magical wand that your dad is, is waving that it is of his power. This is of God. And he's watching you do this. And he's looking down on you. Jacob, think about this. He's watching your mom put goat hair on your neck. Can you imagine how big God, if God wagged his head, how big he would have wagged his head watching Jacob get goat hair put on his head, neck, his mom coming up with this big scheme to do something that God said was going to happen, so we know is going to happen. Despite this, possibly he and his mother believed they truly were doing the work of God through deception. Rebecca, Rebecca had a specific plan. Number one, slay two kids. Uh, we really ought to get out of habit calling children kids. Um, they're the children of goats. And if you research goats in the Bible, it's better to call them children. I understand that maybe we're not intending that. Uh, but it's, it's a good thing to get away from if you, if you can stop that habit. And it's a habit that sometimes I'll even fall into, but I try my best to call them children. Um, kids are baby goats. And uh, go through the Bible and look up what a goat is. Uh, there's also a cost in deception. The approach in verse number 10. Um, she thought about the death of Isaac in verse number 10. She thought of physical deception in verse number 11. She thought of the curse in verse number 13. No thought of the evil of what they were doing, only the consequences of being caught. She thought of the urgency in verse number thir 13. They needed to get this done before Isaac got back. She thought of the recipe in verse number 14. She thought of the garment, the trickery required a garment of the firstborn in verse number 15. And then she thought of the tailoring fitting into their deception. From goat's hair, the stolen garment, to the garment, they had a plan for it all. Every part of what Jacob was going to wear, she had a plan for it all. The one problem beneath it all, uh, there was a pretender. The, that was the big problem. Beneath the, the garment, uh, beneath the hair, beneath 
of the smell of the savory meats beneath the odor of Esau's garment, which is really interesting to me that Jacob or um, Isaac knew Esau by the way he smelled. Makes you wonder what Esau was smelling like. The one problem beneath it all, he was a pretender. He looked, smelled, cooked, and felt like Esau, but he was a deceiver. Boy, that could preach. We have a lot of folks who look and smell and walk and talk like Christians, but beneath it all, God knows their heart, and sometimes they're pharisaical, not trusting Christ to be their Savior. Uh, One may wonder um, who was the most deceived. Jacob, was he the most deceived? That the consequences that he would suffer were at the hand of his father and not of God? Was Rebecca the most deceived? That she could seemingly take the guilt from her son and present herself as a scapegoat for his sin. You ever think about that? The curse be upon me. Oh, how humble. No, you are guiding your son. You can't take his curse. Christ can take our sins. But mama, be careful what you teach your baby because it won't be on, it'll be on you. But it doesn't remove it from him. He still is accountable. Esau, maybe he was the most deceived. That he could be careless with the blessing of God without consequences. Maybe maybe Isaac was the most deceived. That he couldn't tell the difference between his sons any more than he can tell the difference between venison and goat meat. Kind of sad. Uh, I added to this a little bit on um, um, Isaac. He relied on his senses to guide him in his relationship with his sons. When he lost his senses, there wasn't a close enough relationship with either one of his sons to tell them apart. That would be sad. That he had a relationship that was so shallow that it was relying on his eyes, hearing their voice, tasting of the meat, and how they smell. I noticed upon the reproach that approach that Jacob, uh, that of Jacob, that neither he nor his mother discussed what to answer if Isaac asked questions. I think they assumed he wouldn't ask a blessed thing of him, except where's my food? Ouch. Dads, does that cut you to the quick? If, if you were trying to deceive somebody, let's talk about witness protection. <laughs> this is your name, never use the other name again. This is your birth date. This is this, this, this is this, this is where you're from. This is what you've done all your life. This is your mother's name, your maiden name. J- Jacob and Rebecca covered none of that. They just said, go in because your dad is going to rely on his senses to figure out if you're his son. He asked one question. Why'd you get back so soon? And then he had a doubt, but he didn't ask anything. Are you my son? Yeah, I'm your son. No deeper than that, just that's his... I wonder, sometimes I wonder if that's as deep as their relationship went. If it was just a surface relationship. I can't know, but it is interesting that they never even covered that. And then one looks at the questions that Isaac did ask. Isaac asked, how'd you make it back so soon? And who are you? Uh, Isaac then recognizes the voice as Jacob's, but, he, but the hands are Esau. He then, again, does not question a task that would require a personal connection. He smells him and, again, relies on his senses more than his bond with his son. Remember, he favored Esau. But he relied on what he smelt like and how he felt. Seems like there could have been something deeper, a deeper bond there uh, than that. We must be careful 
in our lives that we don't just have surface relationships with our families. We don't want to just have surface relationships where we dig a little deeper than just the natural man. We ought to have a spiritual connection with our children. We ought to have a mental connection, a, a connection. And, and with spiritual connection, I'm not talking about this uh, Oprah spiritual connection garbage. No, I'm talking about you ought to have a spiritual relationship. That's one great thing about these um, devotionals that Brother Green puts out. It would be an easy to understand devotional for you to be able to have with your family or your spouse. You'd be able to read them together. It would be um, a little easier for your children to understand. Uh, but the money has to be there. We, we do have to purchase them. So uh, keep that in mind. It would be a good thing for your family devotions too. Well, uh, let's get to our prayer requests.